I can't tell. Oh, things are whirling. I can't tell if the audio is working or not. I can see. Oh, here we go. Things are happening there. I think we're on. <coughs> Let's assume we're on and uh, so first of my uh, lockdown readings, um, I've put a, a survey out to the newsletter people saying what would you like and the vast majority said they wanted um, Colony B. So the beginning of that is Skeleton Crew, which is the prequel. So I was going to start with that. We'll see how it goes. And then I'll get the audio. So if this live stream isn't very good, I'll take the audio and I will, you know, Put it out separately and the place to find that will be on my blog site at mikeycampling.com so we'll see how it goes and uh, we'll take it from there okay so this is skeleton crew which is a shortish story like a novelette or something like that okay <coughs> see how much we get through before my voice goes chapter one aboard the theron Pantechnican class transport ship, Galactic Resettlement Corps. Technical bridge assistant Nathan Joff glared across the virtually deserted bridge. The captain had called almost everyone else into the executive office, so Joff aimed his scowl at the only other person left, reserve navigation assistant Simon Parkins. The jerk was wearing dark glasses, but he wasn't fooling anyone. The snoring was a dead giveaway. Joff plucked an empty paper cup from his workstation and crushed it in his hand before hurling it at Parkins. The projectile connected neatly with a man's left ear and Parkins sat up with a jolt, his head swivelling from side to side. What the hell? Joff tutted. Seriously, Parkins? You've been out of a sleep pod for three days and you're taking a nap? Parkins grunted and leaned over his console, his fingers hovering over the controls, but never quite making contact. I was just... Running through some figures, you wouldn't understand. Is that a fact? Joff sat back in his chair, his hands behind his head. Tell me, how the hell did a grunt like you get to serve on the bridge? Parkins sniffed. Drafted, same as you. That may have been how you wormed your way into the Corps, but how come you wound up in here with us qualified officers? Qualified? You? All you have to do is watch the scoop monitors all day. You could train a chimp to do it. The gas collector array is a damned important, Joff insisted. The GCA data is part of our scientific mission. Scientific, my ass. We're glorified bus drivers for these sailor types, nothing more. Joff rested his hands on his workstation and leaned forward. Shut up, Parkins. I outrank you and don't you forget it. Parkins pursed his lips and no doubt behind those glasses the bastard was rolling his eyes. Go back to sleep, Joff snapped. He'd wanted to point out that Parkins was only on the bridge because the last guy had stepped into an airlock and opened a vein, his blood boiling away into space. But he bit back the words, returning his attention to the monitors, and his eyes went wide. For the first time in months, the GCA display showed a stark warning, sensor contamination alert. Foreign object detected. Chapter 2 Captain Alistair Coverack drummed his fingers on the glass tabletop, and although the XO was crammed with senior staff, the rhythm he tapped out was the only sound. Chief Navigation Officer Robert Taylor coughed, and Coverack fixed the man with a penetrating stare. We're off course. How could that happen? All eyes went to Taylor. The nav system disregarded the beacon and, and locked onto an incorrect target. The system? Yes, sir. Taylor stiffened his spine. But I should have noticed it sooner. I'm sorry. Right. So what target are we headed for? A marker boy in orbit around planet V536. Coverack frowned. And what's on... V-536. Anything we can use? Could we resupply? Doubtful, Taylor replied. 
it's been explored and designated as habitable, but a supply run would take considerable time, and aside from water, there's nothing of value down there. I see, Coverack said, his voice tight. And how long will it take to get back on course? At current speed, 32 days. Coverack clenched his jaw. Four years and eight months to get this far, and now another month just to get back on track? Shall I program in the course corrections? Taylor asked. Yes, goddammit, Coverack snapped. But I want it double-checked by the first officer. He set his mouth in a grim line, his gaze sweeping across the anxious faces of his senior officers. No more mistakes, people. Not one. Dismissed. Kovarak sat motionless while the officers shuffled out of the room, but when the door closed behind them, he pinched the bridge of his nose. Something was wrong. He could feel it in his bones. He knew the ship, knew her crew, and something, some damned thing he wasn't seeing was not right. Something rotten, he whispered, and a thought came unbidden. The Terran Alliance. They'd fought against the Galactic Resettlement Program, calling it a colonial invasion. They'd carried out a slew of cyber attacks against the Resettlement Corps HQ and caused massive disruption. But had they gone further this time? Had they targeted his ship? Kovarak swiped his fingers across the tabletop to activate the visual interface for Clio, the ship's computer. Clio, show me the navigation logs for the last two months. Complying, a voice answered, and the air above the table was suddenly alive with a web of intersecting lines and glowing icons. Kovarak ran his hand over the mesh of data, rotating the three-dimensional display to de inspect it from several angles, pinching any icons that interested him and then drawing his fingers apart to expand the web of data further. But after a few minutes he was rubbing his eyes and shaking his head. This was slow and clumsy. What am I even looking for, he wondered. But he knew the answer. A ship like the Pharon didn't just lock onto an incorrect beacon by accident. Its core systems were bulletproof, designed to run with minimal intervention. In theory, the ship could cross the galaxy with the whole crew sleeping in the pods and still arrive at its destination on schedule. A navigation error of this magnitude couldn't be accounted for by simple human error. There were checks in place and multiple warning systems that should have been triggered. So that left Kovarak with only one possibility. And I know exactly what I'm looking for, he murmured. I'm looking for a saboteur. Chapter 3 A runnel of perspiration trickled down the back of Joff's neck and crept beneath his collar, but he could do nothing to wipe it away. It had taken him 30 minutes to squeeze into his hazmat suit. 30 minutes of mismatched gloves and fastenings that refused to cooperate, and now the damn suit clung to his sweat-slicked skin, entombing him in an impenetrable shroud of crinkling plastic. He trudged along the corridor that ran below the engineering level, his respirator dangling from his hand and his tool belt jangling at his waist, the reassuring weight of his tools knocking against his hip with every step. As usual, the place was deserted, and his footsteps rang out on the metal floor, the sound echoing across the empty space ahead and behind. This stretch of corridor was so long that the upward curve of the floor was clearly visible, and it reminded him just how huge the pharaoh was. Maybe that was why nobody ever came down here. They're quick to send me, though, Joff thought. No good deed goes unpunished. He snorted, remembering his encounter with the science officer, Joff had been standing beside the main entrance onto the bridge, waiting for her to return so he could report the sense of contamination straight away, but she'd breezed past him without a glance. Feeling his moment slip away, he chased after her like a whipped dog and explained the situation. Well, go and clean it then, she'd snapped. You know the access code, don't you? Josh had tried to hide his scowl. Of course he knew the goddamn code. He checked the GCA bay all the time, didn't he? The hatches, the vents, the cables and connectors. Check, check, check. That was all he ever did. Every damned day. Now he stopped in front of the GCA bay door and stared at the keypad. When was the last time he'd had a change in routine? Three months ago, 
he decided. That time there'd been condensation in the sensor tubes, moist air from the ship leaking through a damaged hatched seal. After replacing the seal, he tracked down the source of the damp air and found a fault in the bay's environmental controls. He'd fix the problem himself rather than wait for the grease monkeys from engineering. It had taken him hours, but so what? There'd been a principle at stake. My bay, my rules, he muttered, and he jabbed at the keypad, tapping in the access code without thinking about it. But his gloved fingers were clumsy and he must have got it wrong because the keypad buzzed and the light above the buttons flashed red. He tried again but accidentally double tapped the third digit. God damn it! Joff pulled off his glove and in two seconds he had the door unlocked. The light on the keypad glowed green and a recorded voice split the silence, its stern tones reminding him to wear his protective gear. All right, all right, Joff grumbled. He donned his full face respirator and tightened the straps checking that it sealed against his skin. The mask smelled like someone had bathed in it and the grease-smeared visor blurred his view. But it was the best respirator he'd been able to find and he was damned if he was going to go back and change it now. He pulled the suit's hood into place and sealed it around his mask. Then he tugged his glove back on and heaved the bay door open. The GCA bay was cloaked in darkness but when he stepped over the threshold the ceiling lights flared into life the harsh glare reflected by the rows of circular hatch covers lining the far wall. Each cover was two feet across, three inches thick and crafted from a single piece of gleaming stainless steel. Joff closed the bay door then walked the length of the room counting off the hatch numbers as he went. The contaminated sensor tube lay behind hatch 17C and thankfully he wouldn't need the stepladder to access it. Joff stopped in front of the correct cover and tapped the small display screen mounted above it. Five rows of digits flashed onto the screen and Josh read them off, taking his time. He'd shut this tube down from the bridge so there was no danger of depressurizing the bay. But even so, whenever Josh had to open a hatch, his stomach squirmed. The idea that he might be sucked into the tube and out into space was hard to shake. Don't be a jerk, he told himself. Then he pulled a wrench from his tool belt his fingers finding the right tool from habit. The cover was secured with twelve sturdy nuts and Joff set to work, loosening them in the correct order. After a full turn of the wrench, he could spin each nut free with a flick of his fingers and catch it in the palm of his hand. There was a knack to it, especially when you were wearing gloves, and Joff smiled as he warmed to his task, pocketing the nuts one by one. Nobody could say he didn't keep the place shipshape and the locking nuts properly lubricated. When Josh removed the final sorry, when Joff removed the final nut, the cover shifted on its hinges with a metallic clunk. There she goes, he whispered, and he took hold of the hatch control lever and pulled it downward. With a gentle hiss of escaping air, the cover swung open to reveal the circular sensor tube. Joff peered inside, staring into the void that seemed to go on forever. In reality, each tube was only twenty yards long but they hadn't been fitted with internal illumination, perhaps because they'd been designed to need no maintenance. The tubes were equipped with automated cleaning arms and each tube's intake was protected by a screening system. But the long journey had taken its toll. The chief engineer hadn't admitted that the screens were beyond repair. He'd just issued Joff with a set of cleaning tools and a bundle of carbon fibre extension rods along with a stern warning not to damage the sensors. Here's hoping I don't need to use the damn things, Joff thought. I'm a technician, not a chimney sweep. He pulled his flashlight from his tool belt and shone it into the opening. Countless rows of sensors glittered as the flashlight's powerful beam passed over them, their polished surfaces reflecting the light like the eyes of some strange swarm of nocturnal animals. Each sensor was powerful enough to detect a single atom and each one gleamed, pristine. Works fine to me, Joff said, and his shoulders slumped. He'd had a wasted journey. But as he swept his flashlight around the tube one last time, something caught his eye. What the hell? Slowly, he traced the flashlight's beam back and there, about five years and there, about five yards from the hatch, 
A dark shape was pressed against the tube's upper surface. The object was the size of a man's fist and it was lodged between two banks of sensors. A frown creased Joff's brow, his skin tugging against the respirator's seal. How had he missed something so large when it was right in front of his eyes? And more importantly, he thought, how the hell am I going to get it out? I'm going to have to stop at the end of that chapter because uh, not only is my throat going, but I find I'm starting to make mistakes reading. So, hopefully, uh, that will all be good. And I'll carry on with another episode tomorrow, which will probably more or less finish it. Don't know what the sound and video quality is going to be like, but I'll um, try and put up a, a cleaner recording of the sound, even if I have to do it all again. Okay, so thank you very much and talk to you tomorrow and stay safe, stay healthy, stay well, stay at home. <laughs> Bye.